Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're entering the last quarter of the year, which means laptops like this one are going to be coming down in price as new models are making their way to market. This is the Lenovo IdeaPad Slim 3i, and I am seeing this for $379 right now on a few different websites, and I'll try to keep the links in the video description up to date so you can find it at that price. And for its price point, I think this is a very capable Windows laptop with a 15.6 inch display. And we're gonna dive into this in just a second, but I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from Lenovo. So we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. So let's dive into the hardware. The first thing I noticed on this was how nice the 15.6 inch touch display looks for the price point. This is certainly not going to be a creator's laptop where you're going to get all sorts of color accuracy, but it does have a very nice matte finish. It is running at 1080p. It has 300 nits of brightness. It is an IPS panel, so it doesn't look cheap. So altogether for this cost, it's nice to see a decent 1080p panel here. When you're shopping though, I would just be sure to pay attention to the specifications. These lower end models from Lenovo tend to have different configurations based on where you're shopping. So some places may have the touch panel and some may not. So just look at all the specifications carefully to make sure you're getting what you want out of it. Now inside this has an i3 1315U processor. It has eight gigabytes of RAM, which unfortunately is not upgradable. So that will hinder some of the higher end things you can do on it. And it has a 256 gigabyte SSD on board, an NVMe that you can upgrade later if you want. So you can upgrade the storage if you need more of that, but unfortunately the RAM is locked in. The uh, system feels pretty nice here. It is not a two-in-one as you can see, so the display goes down flat. It is all plastic, so it lacks some of the polish of the more expensive Lenovo models, so it's not all that well balanced and the display will flop around a little bit, but these are some of the things that uh, you have to live with if you are paying a low price. The performance, as you'll see in a few minutes, is pretty good. It is rather heavy, though. It comes in at 3.57 pounds, or 1.62 kilograms. Additionally, the battery life is not spectacular on this either. You can expect about six to eight hours out of it. And again, battery life, like the fit and finish here and the weight, are things that you sacrifice when you wish to pay a lower price for a laptop. It does, though, have a very nice keyboard and trackpad. This unit has a backlit keyboard, which is great to see on such a low-end model. And you also have room here for a number pad, although the number keys are a little smaller than the letters are. But if you are doing a lot of calculations here, it's nice to have that on board. The trackpad isn't so great on this one. It feels a bit springy, not as high quality as some of the other Lenovo trackpads out there, but it's workable. And again, for the price point, I'm not going to complain too much. You do get a bunch of ports on this one. So on the left-hand side here, you have your barrel connector for power. You have a USB-A slot. There's an HDMI port here. This is going to support HDMI 1.4B. So I think you'll need to use the USB-C port here if you want to output a higher resolution than 1080p on this one, or at least 4K 30. So I would get a dongle and output out the USB-C for higher end displays. Of note here, this is a full service USB-C port. So this will also deliver power to the laptop in addition to the barrel connector here. So if you are connecting it to a docking station, you'll be able to use the port for that. And of course, you've got video out, as I mentioned, and it will support Gen 2 10 gigabit per second data devices. But this is not USB 4 and it is not Thunderbolt. Here you've got your headphone jack. And on the other side, we have a full size SD card slot here and you have a full-size USB-A port as well. Additionally, there is a fingerprint reader on here for biometrics. Now the webcam on this, as you can see, is not spectacular. It is a 720p webcam, not a 1080p one. It also struggled a little bit with the LED lighting in my space here, but it does appear to at least deliver a bare minimum experience if you need it. You also have up here a manual shutter so you can block the lens when it is not in use. So let's dive now into some performance examples and we'll begin with the basics and work our way up from there. So we'll take a look first at the nasa.gov homepage. And as you can see, everything is springing to life here very, very quickly as expected. 
This does have Wi-Fi 6 on board, not Wi-Fi 6E, but I think for the target market here, it is more than adequate. And as you can see here, everything is rendering up very, very quickly and nicely on this beautiful touch display here. Additionally, I did some YouTube a little bit earlier and I was able to get a 60 frames per second video to run without any significant drop frames. It did drop a few when I first started it, but after that all was good and I was able to uh, watch Netflix and some other services on here as well. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test running in Google Chrome, we got a score of 279. This puts it right in line with other current processors from Intel and AMD. And it's also going to do just fine for all the other types of basic tasks you would do on a low-end Windows laptop. This is Microsoft Word running here. Didn't see any performance gotchas there and all was good. Now I also did a little video editing on it and that's where it struggled a bit. And I think the issue here, this is DaVinci Resolve by the way, is that we only have eight gigabytes of RAM available and it has to share that small amount of memory between the system and the video. And when you're editing 4K 60 video like this, it's going to be a bit sluggish due to the lack of RAM that it has to work with. So although I think you'll be okay doing casual video editing for 1080p files, for example, anything beyond that's going to be a struggle on this machine just because it doesn't have a lot of system memory to take care of it. Now I also ran some games on it and it actually did better than I expected. This is Red Dead Redemption 2 that I was running at 720p and I was getting about 25 to 30 frames per second. It was mostly in the 25 frames per second range. So a little lower than you know I would consider to be playable, but it was workable. The only issue though is that the longer I played, the less reliable it got. So after a few minutes here, it started locking up. And I think this is just due to the lack of RAM that we have to play with here. If this machine had 16 gigabytes of RAM, it would probably do better. Now I did run another game called No Man's Sky, one of my favorites. And this one I ran at 720p and I was getting about 45 to 60 frames per second, but a lot of lag here as you can see. And again, I think that has something to do with the lack of RAM on this. So I think some of the lower end games will do quite well, especially a lot of the retro inspired games and certainly older games like Half-Life 2 and others will run great. But I think some of the more demanding titles given the lack of RAM on here will struggle a little more even though the system has the capacity to actually do some pretty decent graphics generation. Unfortunately on this machine, an external GPU is not a possibility because you don't have a USB 4 port or a Thunderbolt port there on the left hand side. And of course game streaming is a good solution on a device like this because you have the Wi-Fi 6 and a nice 1080p display. Now we did run the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test and there we got a score of 1,154. It actually held its own, believe it or not, against a couple of Ryzen 4th and 5th generation processors we looked at on similar laptops not too long ago. So again, if we had a little bit more RAM in here, I think we could do a little bit more in the gaming arena. Additionally, we ran the 3D Mark stress test and there this did very well. We got a score of 99.2%. You can also see what temperature the processor was running at at the conclusion of that test. And that test, of course, tests to see how well the system can perform under a heavy sustained load. It runs this test over and over again to see if there's any drop off in performance. And there wasn't really anything noticeable, which was great. And that's because it does have a fan. So you'll need to keep the bottom portion of the laptop clear and it will suck the air in from the bottom and exhaust it out through uh, some vents there next to the hinge on the display. The fan isn't all that noisy. Typically when you're working on a website or on a Word document or something, you're not going to hear the fan all that often. Typically when you get these laptops for the first time, they start doing a lot of updates when you first take them out of the box. So you're going to hear that fan a little bit more initially. But after everything is settled down, generally when you're doing basic work, it won't be all that loud. Lenovo does have some controls that you can manage through their Vantage app that will allow you to change how the fan behavior works. So for example, right now I've got mine on the high performance mode. And if we browse around here to the device settings and go to power, we can adjust how the system behaves. So if I scroll down a little bit here, and we go into the battery saving mode, you'll likely hear the fan kick on a little less frequently. Now you have stereo speakers here underneath the display hinge. It's nice that they're on the top. Unfortunately though, the speakers are a bit on the tinny side. So if you plan to listen to music with this thing, I would attach some headphones either through the headphone port 
or use some Bluetooth headphones. All right, one last thing to check out, and that is its Linux performance. We booted up the most recent version of Ubuntu here, and all of the hardware was detected successfully. So the audio, the Wi-Fi, the video, the touch display, the camera, everything seemed to work and everything performed quite nicely on this. So if you were looking to run an alternative operating system, this might be something to consider for that, especially given its price point. So all in, this is one of those typical trade-offs you have to consider when you are shopping for a low-cost laptop. You always get one nice thing on the laptop, but not all the nice things that you get on a more expensive one. So for this one, the nice thing is the touch panel here. It looks very, very nice for a low-cost device. The performance isn't bad here either, although again, we're struggling a bit with only eight gigabytes of RAM when we've got higher end tasks that we might want to do on it. So upgradable RAM would have been a nice add-on here, but again, you are definitely making a few sacrifices for its overall price tag. But other than that, I think it's a nice laptop if you are on a tight budget. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic KGR, Tom Albrecht, and I'm the Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.